Welcome to Friends of American Writers. We will now join the meeting. Karen Pulver is going to introduce our speaker today, someone we're very lucky to have, who was supposed to speak to us at the fortnightly last April, but you know how that went. So we're very happy to be able to offer this program today. Karen? Oh, here I come. Okay. We are, as Tammy said, very fortunate today to welcome author Jane Hamilton. Ms. Hamilton and her writing are truly representative of the Midwest. She grew up in Oak Park, as you are about to hear. Um, she went to college in Minnesota, yay. Um, and she um, lives in a Wisconsin apple orchard. All of her books are set, at least in part, in Wisconsin, according to Wisconsin Lit Map. Jane's best known novels are The Book of Ruth, published in 1988, and Map of the World in 1994. Um, I didn't have to research this at all because these were books selected by Oprah Winfrey for her very uh, prestigious book club. And I remember all of this because we librarians could not possibly keep up with the demand for these books. Um, I have it on good authority that Jane is a talented teacher and I hear that she writes every day. Although like us, Jane is disappointed that there's no elegant lunch. She agreed to come and speak to us anyway and will talk to us about growing up in the community of Oak Park. So welcome, Jane Hamilton. Thank you, thank you for being here. Um, and I'm assuming that everybody can hear me. And hello, Kristen Ginger, who was my student at Carleton College in 2008, I believe. Um, anyway, it's great to be here. And I, I just wanna start by saying that when I was on the schedule to speak last year, I thought about the trip I'd make into Chicago from Wisconsin on Amtrak's Hiawatha and how I'd walk up from Union Station up the avenue past my old haunts and the haunts of my forebears too. Recently, I've been reading the memoirs of one of my great grandfathers, Henry Raymond Hamilton. This beautiful little book is called Footprints. Um, and it was published in, um, uh, well, in the eight, uh, 1927. Um, and uh, so there were, there were many Hamilton forebears men who lived through the early days of Chicago and who, um, although they weren't traditionally educated, they were um, amazingly, uh, they, they had a, a, a profound education through their reading and so not surprisingly they were wonderful writers my great etc great etc how many greats i'm a little vague on it but aunt was reportedly the first white baby born in chicago in 1804 i think it was the hamilton men were builders movers and shakers and in their lifetimes chicago went from a little outpost to a town and in really fairly quick order to a metropolis my great uncle was Gurdon Stoltensall Hubbard. Yes, Hubbard Street, that guy. He was a fur trapper and trader, a land speculator. He was revered apparently by the Kickapoo Indians, adopted by their chief, referred to as son, and he married Watsika, the niece of the chief. Watsika, Illinois is named for her because she was worthy of a place name in her own right. Gurdon Saltonstall Hubbard was named Swift Walker by the Kickapoo peoples and he was not only intellectually brilliant speaking several languages including that of the Kickapoo but physically heroic beating the strong young men of the First Nation in an endurance contest that's the lore anyway Swift Walker his biography um, is really pretty um, interesting. 
So how did that man see the native people? He apparently loved their culture. He lived among them. He had many children, I think eight with Watsika, none of whom survived. He did business with the Kickapoo and sometimes it seems on their behalf. He also was part of a negotiating team that secured all the lands of the Chippewa, the Ottawa and the Potawatomi along the Western shore of Lake Michigan how to make sense of that. I'm guessing he felt that they were justly compensated by the government and they were promised land elsewhere. His marriage to Watsika didn't last. He married twice more, but didn't own up to that first marriage during his lifetime. If only he could be interviewed now by Terry Gross. Gurdon, what did you really feel about that treaty? And what did it mean to you to be an adopted son of the Kickapoo chief? We don't really know. So I come from those plunderers, those builders, those learned men who conquered the territories and were instrumental in imagining Chicago, raising it up from the swamp. And then after the great fire, they reconceived it, building it in brick. I can't help but think of them when I'm in, on the city's streets. For many years, bear with me in this long introduction, I did fundraising work for the Ragdale Foundation in Lake Forest. Ragdale, that most wonderful house designed by Howard Van Doren Shaw, a house of peace, quiet, beauty, cleanliness, great food and time for artists and writers. Years ago, I met a woman named Trisha Foley at a cocktail party. She'd grown up in Lake Forest and was a supporter of Ragdale, even though for many years she'd been living in For Park Forest or Forest Park. Forest Park. I kept meeting her at the yearly fundraisers and always I looked forward to seeing her. We kept saying, oh, we should get together outside of Ragdale, but we never did. She had red hair, red lipstick, and amazing spectacles that were both funky and elegant and the same for her clothing. It was unconventional and beautiful and elegant and so with all due respect and love to and for the Lake Forest ladies, in relation to them, she was bohemian and seemed a little out of place at the cocktail parties. Years passed. I was going to do an event at the Forest Park Library and Trisha wrote me and wondered if I'd like to stay overnight. Sure, why not? It seemed a little potentially awkward to accept an invitation from someone I didn't know very well from someone I admired for her glasses frames and her shoes, but I loved the cut of her conversational jib too. During dinner, we got to talking about the Hubbard Street Dance Company. I said, because I have pride in this notion, which would be obscure to anyone, nonetheless, I said, Hubbard Street is my street. Trisha sat straighter. She looked directly into my eyes. No, she said firmly and kindly, Hubbard Street is my street. Ah, uh, no, it's mine, I countered. My middle name is Hubbard. Surely that would settle the matter. I don't remember exactly what she said to one up me. It was maybe my mother's maiden name is Hubbard or my brother's name is Hubbard, but it didn't take us too long then to understand that we are cousins. Both come from Gurdon Saltonstall Hubbard, something like third cousins seven times removed, Hubbard Street is both of our streets. All that to say, in Chicago, I feel the weight of history walking up the avenue. I feel pride in my ancestors, but I also know what guilt they bear in the erasure of the First Nation, all the sins they committed in the name of Manifest Destiny, which flash forward has a great deal to do with the degradation of the planet. How are we to be responsible to future generations now? How do we exact racial justice for the past crimes and failures? So there's justice in the present and for the generations to come. All these are questions that loom for all of us in one way or another as we go forward into what we can only hope is a new age. That's a long introduction about how I would have felt being in Chicago, joyful, burdened, hopeful and how notwithstanding the fact that I'm not with you physically and we're not having a fabulous lunch, it's a pleasure to be here with you. So thank you for having me and for taking a break from the impeachment hearings. 
Moving forward on my timeline from the Windy City to Oak Park, no doubt all of you know what Oak Park is famous for, in addition to Frank Lloyd Wright, Ernest Hemingway, and Roy Kroc. There is, for me most notably, Carol Shields, although comparison is odious. Give me Carol Shields any day over Hemingway. In the 1950s, Percy Julian, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, was one of the few African Americans to live in Oak Park. His work made possible the invention of the birth control pill, that little pill that changed history. Arsonists tried to burn his house down not once, but twice. So that's the setting for what I think of as my Norma story. Norma. My freshman year at Oak Park and River Forest High School, I was in girls choir, the place for all the new girls who wished to sing and also for those who didn't have the chops for the higher level choirs. At the end of that year, I tried out for the acapella choir, top of the line. Acapella was for the serious and the talented, those who could read music and had developed voices. Mr. Kratke had been the girls choir director for decades and he was retiring. Before he made his exit, he was to choose the next year's acapella choir members. And so it was for him that I sang. The new choral director had been hired, but she wasn't yet in Illinois. Here's the thing. Acapella choir at the time was like the House of Lords. The seats were passed down generation to generation. My older sister had been in acapella choir. Therefore, Mr. Cracky probably gave me the golden ticket without even thinking. But really, I was not acapella choir material. I had a very small range, a spindly little nothing of a voice. And there I was going to take a place among the deserving. I was a genuine fake. The next year, my sophomore year, that was the year that Norma Rabin came to town, the new head of the choral department. She was one of three African-American teachers at Oak Park High at that time. Oak Park, through some tactics that were illegal and others merely questionable, had instituted a racial quota system in the 60s and 70s, the plan designed to integrate the community slowly, methodically, a black a block. That was actually the slogan. Only a certain number of minorities could buy or rent in any given year in order to discourage white flight. The dream of integration bumping up against the reality of making it happen. The quota method has been by many measures successful African Americans in the 2010 census about 22% of the population. The recent heart-wrenching documentary about Oak Park High, America to Me, chronicles the school's earnest attempts and their failures to address the achievement gap between the black and white students and focuses on teachers who are determined to cut through entrenched racism. There was a gorgeous black student in my time, the only black girl in our drama group, and she was always cast as the maid. So, Norma Rabin couldn't rent or buy in Oak Park. She had to live miles away in Wheaton. She was 35 years old. Her musical aesthetic was more adventuresome than Frank Kratke's or Miss Edna Ruth Woods, also retired teachers who'd been institutions who were all about the school's traditions. We're loyal to you, Oak Park High. Norma mixed it up. We sang a Bach oratorio, but also Stravinsky's Symphony of Psalms, Britain's St. Nicholas Cantata, and a work by Thea Musgrave, a Scottish woman, a living person. Her piece somewhat atonal, a concert which made some of the dowagers of Oak Park and River Forest, it made their heads explode. And I mean, not in a good way. Norma, a few of the choir members, not me, I was not cool enough, but some of them were friends with her. They were allowed to call her Norma. Mrs. Rabin, by all names, was exacting. She was both scary and loving, which makes for pedagogical magic. Fear, I sometimes think, is given short shrift in today's teachers' colleges, but it can work wonders. Norma had a medium-sized afro. She had great turnout, like a ballet dancer. And she often wore polyester dresses that were orange, magenta, green, blazing, swirling colors. Not the wool skirts, white blouses, and cardigans of Miss Edna Ruth Wood. 
Although later we learned that Edna Ruth wasn't what she appeared to be, straight-laced prim conventional, that she lived with Miss Brown, the PE teacher for 40 years. They'd had a marriage, who knew? This was a different era, of course, when gay people, even in a place like Oak Park, a village that purported to be progressive, had to hide. There's sometimes more than meets the eye, although sometimes what meets the eye is the thing. How to discriminate between what we think is apparent and what we suppose is invisible is especially the writer's charge. That space between the visible and the hidden is the space, the vessel that holds gossip, conspiracy theories, as well as the truth. The trick to figure out what is what. For the writer of fiction, Flannery O'Connor said, everything has its testing point in the eye. Judgment is something that begins in the act of vision. And when it becomes separated from vision, then a confusion exists in the mind. In a cappella choir, we had to sing at the beginning of the year so Norma could place us in our sections. We had to sing alone in front of everyone. And when I did my paces up our, the scale, my poor little voice fracturing, Norma's eyeballs started to spin. You could see her thinking, what the hell, Frank Cracky? Why did you give me her? Aside from a few humiliations though, seventh period was the best period of the day. Everyone raising their voices together to make beauty and meaning, to be in the presence of beauty with Norma, guided by Norma, none of it possible without Norma. We sang in German and French and Hebrew. She made us really speak the language, articulate the words. She demanded we understand them, understand the feeling behind them. There was a boy named Felix Worman in my class who grew up to be a professional cellist. And when he was in his fifties, he bought a gas station in Albuquerque where he lived. In that gas station, he created the Church of Beethoven. Every Sunday, top-notch people performed string quartets of Beethoven, Brahms, Mozart, Bach, and contemporary music too. He said it wasn't the theology he liked, it was the ecstasy of the music and the warmth of the parishioners enjoying it together. Worman said he founded the church to help people find spirituality through culture. He named the church after Beethoven because in his view, Beethoven poured all that spirituality that he couldn't find a place for in the tr traditional church straight into his art. Worman said on NPR when he was interviewed before his death, something like, why would anyone turn his back on someone like Beethoven who has already accessed a certain spiritual level and that you as the listener can access too? It's an easy pass to a higher plane. That's what we did in a cappella choir. We were experiencing composers who had a level of spirituality that they'd had the wherewithal to put on the page. And many of us in seventh period felt lifted up being in the presence of those minds. There was plenty of real life too. Once there was a fight on the school grounds, a knife was involved. This was long before anyone dreamed of shooting their classmates. The fight was racial, a black kid, a white kid. Norma was so angry. We all remember her standing on her conductor's platform, her feet turned out, holding out her bare arm and slicing her skin with an imaginary knife saying, if you cut me, my blood is red too. She was often that dramatic, no matter her subject. We remember how she looked at each of us. She bore into each of us, or so it seemed, turning her head from the altos, the tenors, the basses, the sopranos. High school is, of course, a time for love. I was in love with the remarkable, amazing tenor, Matt, I'll call him. He loved me back. The autumn poem called The More Loving One goes, how should we like it were stars to burn with a passion for us we could not return? If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. Would you rather be the beloved or the one who loves? Matt and I, we had equal affection. I believed this. And perhaps this is too much information, but we never had sexual intercourse. So the desire was always at a full boil, almost moving toward a fulfillment that was not yet, not yet. It's rare to be sure that 
floor play goes on for years. In sum, high school was for me Norma. It was my great English and history teachers. It was seventh period every day and it was Matt. Not so much the turbulence of my time, the assassinations of the 60s, the civil rights movement, the murder of the Kent State kids, the Vietnam War, the Watergate debacle, which now seems so quaint. No, my interests lay elsewhere. Everything that wasn't the making of beauty and Matt was in the background. After all, I lived in little old Oak Park, the progressive place with wide lawns that was safe. Time passed. We grew up. More time passed, more than 30 years. One of us from the choir got the idea to have a little reunion. Not all the singers, there'd been 60 of us or so, but there those who were the life time friends, we would meet and we would sing and we would invite Norma. I volunteered to try to find her. We'd have the party at my great grandfather's lake house, Henry Raymond Hamilton. He built it, the ancestral home in Wisconsin, which I'd inherited along with several cousins. Henry Raymond Hamilton had built the place for his wife in uh, 1885, a custom for people of a certain class in the mid to late, on, late 1800s to have country homes in order to escape the heat, the summer heat and cholera. Cholera was big in Chicago. There was enough space there for 25 people. There was the lake and the old piano with only one missing key. I found Norma easily. She left Oak Park after only four years. She'd gone to teach at Spelman College in Atlanta. We'd suspected that teaching high school wasn't her life's ambition, and especially not in a community where A, she couldn't live, and B, the mother's heads exploded if the Alleluia chorus wasn't sung every Christmas. 30 years later, Norma had retired from Spelman and was the director of a church choir in Atlanta. Her email address was on the website. I wrote her saying that she probably wouldn't remember me or many of us, but that we, and I listed the friends, wanted to get together to sing the old music and then we'd pay for her trip to come to Wisconsin. She wrote back immediately, I remember each one of you. Yes, I'd love to come. The July weekend was about to begin. A few of us were there the night before the rest of the group. Laura D, not to be confused with Laura P, went down to O'Hare to pick up Norma. We waited, cleaning, cooking, putting flowers in the bedrooms, all nervous and in a tizzy. The car came up the drive. Laura D parked. Norma opened the door. I ran to greet her. Norma! She was older, of course, rounder, she had very short hair and orange now, her afro taken down nearly to her scalp. I hugged her. I said, I'm Jane. She said, oh, you were the only one I didn't remember. There are times when it is much better not to be remembered. Alleluia. We go down to the lake. I'm changing tenses here. The first thing Norma does is lower herself to the planks of the wooden pier. The second thing that happens, a sliver from the plank enters her index finger. We all have different thresholds for pain. And Norma, it's as if she's been shot through the heart. She screams, she is inconsolable. Her pain does not subside, it doesn't ever flow. It's as if it's a flame, it only burns brighter. She sobs. We talk about getting a needle, some rubbing alcohol, digging the shard out. Ow! We talk about the emergency room. No, we consider amputation, not funny. What has happened? Norma has become our child. Gradually, we're able to talk her off the ledge. We are allowed to apply a some Neosporin and a Band-Aid. She's finally calm enough to swallow an over-the-counter analgesic. Laura P appears with a tray, some gin, some whiskey. The crisis in its intense phase seems to have passed. Dinner ensues. During the course of the weekend, Norma shows her bandaged finger to every new guest, holding up her hand saying, my finger. The whole situation is peculiar and unnerving and we think funny and tender. It's something we could never have imagined during seventh period back in 1973. 
when we gather in the living room, when we start to sing, then Norma becomes the old Norma. She is stern, she is unyielding. She says, altos, if you're flat the next time on that F sharp, I am going to kill you. We are so happy. You want a portal to your young self, sing together with the old group, time will go backwards. My beloved, beautiful Matt, who I haven't seen in 25 years is there. His tenor more vibrato-y than it had been, but still the same reeds are vibrating in his smooth white throat. We sing Brahms, the Nanye, even though it's now past our ability. On the second night at dinner, when we are about to sing O Manum Mysterium as a grace, Norma asks me to go get the A from the piano, which is out the door of the cookhouse and into the door of the main house and down a hall. She wants me to bring the A back to the table. This is before our cell phones could have provided it. Okay. I get the A to the piano, A, A, I keep it alive in my mouth, A, 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 down the hall, out the door, A, A, along the walkway, in the door, to the table, A. I feel as if I've been asked to get the embers that will start the fire. I've been charged with a task that will keep us alive. I always felt like an untouchable in choir, the lowest of the low, but Norma, 30 years later, reverses that feeling. We are all that night living in a dream, held in a space outside of time. It's not something that can be sustained in real life, these bonds that are old and fast and true, but they aren't part of our daily life, the life of marriage, children, work, caretaking of elderly parents. In this dream, we sing, O Manum Mysterium, and at the table, we are all talented and we are all beautiful, and somehow we're all young again. The next morning, I'm up early, and one of the Lauras, Laura P, comes into the kitchen. She looks more than a little wrecked. Are you okay, I ask. She says, oh, Jane, I haven't slept. The most amazing thing happened last night. What, says I. She tells me first that Greg, the brother of Matt, Greg, brought peyote buttons on the airplane from San Francisco. Who does that? And that along with Laura D and Greg, they'd eaten some and then they'd all slept together, the two Lauras and Greg, not sex, but all of them in the same bed, holding each other, and that the most amazing thing had happened. I'm gonna leave the story there for a minute and talk about race. The story of Norma isn't so much about race, except that it is, it's always there in the backdrop. My question is, how do I tell this story now? If I'm telling it as I'm telling it, Norma is not fully realized. It's about how she affected all of us students, all of us white kids. As much as we thought we weren't seeing race, as much as for us the Norma experience seemed to transcend race, engaged as we were in the intense work of making music, I don't know that we can ever erase it from our consciousness. Should we or shouldn't we try to erase it? The writer Karen Joy Fowler wrote me recently in our endless discussions of this matter. She wrote, Matthew Salesis credits Ursula Le Guin for creating one of the first black heroes in a fantasy novel, but he complains too that she put him in a world in which race doesn't matter. But I also remember, Karen says, Chip Delaney, a, a black science fiction writer talking about reading The Faded Sun decades and decades, uh, decades ago and realizing a hundred pages in that the narrator was black. The creation of a world in which blackness mattered so little was to him the most powerful thing the writer could have done. His mind was beautifully blown. Yes, no, yes, no. In terms of my writing life, what am I allowed to write if I tell this story? Sometimes I feel so close to being able to step into Norma's shoes, which is not something I feel I can say, which I fear I might be eviscerated for saying here in this very moment. But sometimes I feel that I have the powers 
to see the world from Norma's vantage point. She's the outsider looking at the sea of high school students on the risers, their faces, their postures, their talents, their vulnerabilities. Norma raising her baton, coaxing music from each of us. Music, the thing she's staked her life on. Is it possible that she loves us? How is it that she can love us? She think, probably thinks of race far more than we do. She sees our privilege, of course. She reflects on advantages she didn't have. Why did she take this job? Really, she wants to teach at an all black college. There's so many questions to probe. When I start to articulate her experience to myself, I stop. A voice says, you cannot tell Norma's story. That is not for you to tell. You cannot try to inhabit her. I'm stuck then in my own experience, as rich as it was, I'm persuaded by my own internal thought policewoman not to try to enter Norma's consciousness, not to be writerly or even frankly human when it comes to trying to imagine what it is to be Norma. I've been told that I, that I will not, I cannot get it right. The policing of sub subject matter, the questions of who gets to tell which stories have been stirring for some time now. I look back at my work and wonder, what if I'd been frightened about these matters when I started writing back in the 70s? Would I have written a book about a girl named Ruth who was branded white trash? Would I have written a novel from the point of view of a gay boy who wants to be a ballet dancer? It never occurred to me that I was trespassing when I wrote the short history of a prince. Would I have written about a physically challenged young woman who has a black cleaning lady in an Oak Park world set in the 70s? Would I have thought twice about satirizing a character who wants to be a writer but isn't a reader? Laura Ryder's masterpiece is not a nice book. It takes no prisoners. Even if you give your novel ahead of publication to a sensitivity reader, how can one or two sensitivity readers stand in for a whole culture? It's always been so that some writer's material is not deemed of interest to others or is not allowed because of offending content. There have always been prevailing winds favoring the experience and culture of white European people. The winds are changing and it's been a long, long time in coming and it's high time, alleluia. And there is this for me personally, I am of an age to look back on my career and see that if I were writing now, that career using my material would not be possible. My material is my material. It's what I have to work with. And to some degree, I cannot go beyond its limits by vir virtue of my portion of talent. And also now because the culture says there are places I must not venture. The question for anyone writing now how do we use our material? How do we tell our stories with sensitivity and truthfulness and at the same time remain free as we go about the business of creation of making something from nothing? Here's what Willa Cather said about material. When a writer once begins to work with his own material, he realizes that no matter what his literary excursions may have been, he's been working with it from the beginning by living it. The material seems to be there of itself already molded. In working with this material, he finds that he need have little to do with literary devices. He comes to depend more and more on something else. The thought by which our feet find the road home on a dark night, accounting of themselves, for roots and stones, which he had never noticed by day. About the essential matter of his story, he cannot argue this way or that. He has seen it, has been enlightened about it in flashes that are as unreasoning, often as unreasonable as life itself. The material, Cather says, seems to be there of itself already molded. And so my material takes me back to Norma and back to the Lauras and Greg, their night together, their shocking revolution, re revelation, which, and I'm now going to commit the, maybe the worst sin a writer can com commit, which is to say at this point in the story, I don't really remember what the shocking thing was. 
so I can't really tell you. But I think about writing the Norma story. And if I did, it would involve a subplot that speaks to the main plot, the character of Greg, eccentric, beleaguered, hangdog Greg, who's really not had success in love, and how, for whatever reason I'll make up, he cried for much of the night in the arms of the Lauras, the gorgeous, beautiful, sexy Lauras. Greg would have been more than thrilled to have just one of the Lauras, but that night he got the company of both. In terms of structure, I'll have to somehow yoke that story to Norma's story. I'd want the Norma story to end exactly as Lori Moore ended her gorgeous novella, Who Will Run the Frog Hospital? If you want the true end of the Norm Norma story, read the last paragraph. It's so beautiful and I can't ever get through it without sobbing into a five gallon drum, so good. But anyway, since I can't plagiarize from Lori Moore much as I'd wish to, I might end the Norma story with the sale of the great grandfather's lake house. Ah, the ending of the family house a couple of years ago that tore up that family, that created division and brought all of us grief. I didn't realize until I read an article about Henry Raymond Hamilton's library, this article that was tucked in the book, that many of his books were at the lake house that his long love affair with books filled the shelves. I didn't realize they were all his. I was the one who took apart the books. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't put it together that they were, that so many of them were, were, were his until they'd all gone in different directions, bought up for 50 cents a book by women who deal in antiques. I'm guessing that somebody would have liked to have that collection from a certain time and place intact. Oh. Well, when I closed the door for the last time at that house, every scrap of furniture, every dish, every bed sheet gone, gone to the winds, all the rooms empty, I felt as if I were closing among other, others, among the ancestors also, closing in the young people of acapella choir and Norma, keeping them who had been us safe. A delusion, of course, but one I stick with, even as that wonderful old house has been leveled. Here's another possibility for the ending. Matt comes back into it. Dear first boyfriend, the ending is about his making a documentary about the spiritual life of Elvis, which is a true fact. He's actually doing that. He believes, he's absolutely certain that Elvis lives. Matt is a natural storyteller and it is after all storytellers that we look to for hope. So I'm here to say that never mind the reality, here's to the dream. Here's to Elvis living down in Florida in the Witness Protection Program, one of the thousands of Elvis impersonators who posts songs on YouTube. This is what Matt says, that Elvis is still posting his songs on YouTube. But the thing is, there's so many impersonators on YouTube that you'd be hard pressed to find the real man but he's there, Matt says, and he's writing new material, which is the only thing that any writer wants to do, however she can manage it. So that's the end of um, that portion of this experience. And um, um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Um, let's see how, maybe hold up your hand if you have a question um, and tell me if you see somebody else holding up their hand. Well, I have to say that your uh, oral storytelling is as captivating as your writing. It's, I, that's not always the case, but uh, <laughs> Thank you. I mean, that Norma story is, um, you know, there's certain things in life that kind of feel like they come packaged ultimately as an intact story. Um, and 
after our Norma uh, Palooza, you know, it just, it just, the whole thing was kind of there. It was, it was just such a powerful experience. And, um, and also just back to Willa Cather, she said that the purpose of art was to recreate or to remember being young. And certainly um, there are other purposes for art, but I think in a certain, for me, that's uh, become one of the more um, um, pleasurable experiences I have writing when I'm sort of um, looking back um, and making sense of things. So, but you know, the Norma story that was just like, here, here it is. Well, thank you. Dale, you had a question? Dale, unmute yourself. I was just applauding. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I put up that emoji. Ah. Okay. Well, well. Oh, yeah. Karen Pulver. Yeah, I would have to say that I always appreciate the um, stories about teachers and the impact that they have on so many people that they don't necessarily know they're having at the time. I have a feeling that she did, but um, you know the the respect that you're showing her and the um, the honor that you're giving. I think it's it's wonderful. Well, thank you, and I I feel like um, having taught myself, um, which and, and one of the reasons I feel like I I could possibly connect to Norma is just that feeling of looking out into the classroom and seeing all these faces, and um, I'm kind of terrified by teenagers. Um, so just that whole that whole teacher's um, experience of um, trying to act as if you are in charge and uh, and also how much failure is involved with the enterprise. I mean, you know, there's just so many classes where I've come home and just thought, oh, I just I really screwed that up. That was that did not go well. And, and there's something about being in the classroom that you can't, there's a, a shuang fei or a je ne sais quoi, you can be totally prepared and think that you're gonna have a great day and it'll, it just bombs. And conversely, you can think I've, I'm not really in control and somehow it just, it just happens. So it, it, there's a very, it's a very, um, I mean, I don't know if a first grade teacher feels that as much as somebody who's teaching every single day, but I've, I've taught sporadically in the, the whole workshop thing. And um, it just, uh, it's, it's a mysterious uh, synergy that happens. Um, and, and, you know, also, well, I had this teacher at, at college in Carleton College, and um, I overheard him telling, telling somebody else, he did not say this to me, but he told somebody else that I would write a novel someday. And I just written little short stories for him. And I was so startled by that. And it meant so much to me that he said that. And I think in a way it was more powerful that, that he was telling somebody else. Um, and in a way it had more validity because there was, you know, it was just, it was, he wasn't, trying to be nice to me or encouraging me. He was just saying, this is, this is something that I think to be true. Um, so anyway, years, years, years later, I um, was with him and he's Australian, an Australian poet. And I told him that story and he was like, oh God, oh no, no, don't tell me those stories. I hate those stories. Oh, I hate to hear the, the power of the teacher. <laughs> and, and he was just, he was, he was mortified and I, kind of know that feeling too because I've had students who said you know you said this thing to me once and I just think oh my god what and then they say what I said and you know I have no memory of it but it's so it's it's a it's a very um it's a very uneasy position to be in I've, I've found I have a question um you referred in passing to having a sensitivity reader is um, that a thing uh, um I haven't had a sensitivity reader myself, um, but that is a thing out in the world now that publishers um, uh, have um, on staff or they farm it out that if there's, particularly if there's a book that um, is deemed potentially offensive, 
to one group or another, they get somebody from that group to vet it. Um, and um, I, um, you know, I'm an old person, so I, I, it sounds kind of ridiculous to me and not always successful. Um, there was somebody who was a sensitivity reader that was his job and he wrote a novel. <laughs> I think he was um, um, Native American and um, the novel that he wrote was deemed completely insensitive. So, you know, I mean, <clears throat> can't we just let the marketplace or whatever happens to a book happen? Um, after it has been read. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of scary stuff t that t in my way of thinking now where books get um, eviscerated, you know, via Twitter mob. Um, and oftentimes they haven't even been read by the people who have taken offense. They've just heard that they're something terrible in them. So anyway, um, it's, a, it's a strange time to be writing. It's a strange time period, but you know, <laughs> for many reasons. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. Um, thank you so much for, for being here and for having me. And um, perhaps um, one of these days we will meet in person. Oh, Once we would love to have you back when we can show you a really good time. So <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> okay. And uh, Everybody else stay warm and we'll see you next month when C Cynthia Clampett, uh, Karen help me with this. Uh, yeah, Cynthia Clampett, um, also known in this particular circle as the pig lady, uh, <laughs> who spoke to us about, about her studies in, in pigs last year and everybody liked her so much. She's coming back, she has a new book and it's about historic places in the Midwest and she thinks that uh, when we start traveling again, that's probably where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing, taking little road trips. And um, you know her as a very entertaining speaker and hope to see you back. Okay, well, see Thank you next you. month then. Bye-bye. Be well, thank you.